should fix that. Uh, you want me to uh, like tomorrow or something, redo this and send it to you or? Nah, it'll be fine. Uh, as long as you remember to send me the presentation. Yeah, sure. I don't think I got your last one either. Um, for, for those who just joining on the recording, I apologize. I forgot to actually record David's presentation. Um, so uh, I apologize for that. Um, moving right along, uh, Stephen. Woe us with your presentation on Pluto like you did for Mars. And... Got to unmute oh. first. I did not make you the presenter tonight. Nope. There we go. Made Doug the go. presenter. I'm the presenter tonight. Force the habit for Doug. All right. Let me share my screen and we'll get going. OK. Uh, and then this is in the way. I'm going to go to slideshow. I'm not quite sure why it's not cooperating in the, from the beginning. Okay, so the topic tonight, oops, let's go back. So topic tonight is Pluto and uh, Sharon, because uh, I think that they deserve sort of a, a dual respect as a, not quite a double planet, but certainly uh, worth uh, some attention in, in how they uh, came to be discovered and also how they uh, are, uh, what they're like in space. Um, so I'm uh, going to be covering a little bit of both. Uh, they both have their own histories and like, and this is the May uh, 2021 presentation for AFSIG. So this is a picture of Pluto, uh, and we'll go into how this picture was uh, taken in, in towards the end of this uh, presentation, but this is uh, essentially what it looks like. Um, we only have uh, a picture and documentation of the northern end of the planet. Uh, that is because when the New Horizons probe went by, uh, the southern part was uh, entirely in darkness. Um, and that has to do with the way that Pluto uh, rotates around on its axis. Um, but as you can see, it's a, a fascinating object with a lot of different features and a lot of different details. And we'll go into a little bit more about that as we go along. But just to give some facts and figures, uh, the semi-major axis, meaning the, the average distance between the uh, Pluto and the Sun is about 39.482 uh, AUs, with an AU being the distance between Earth and the Sun. Uh, so that's about five, uh, almost six billion kilometers. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very distant. But notice the difference between a, a Pelion and a Perihelion. Uh, at its farthest distance is 49 AUs, and at its closest distance is 30 AUs, which takes it inside the orbit of Neptune, although they never actually come close because they're in a, um, a, a type of orbit that um, it keeps them uh, well apart. There's never any danger of any collision between the two. Um, its eccentricity is point to, uh, 0 0.24, which is very high. What that means is that its orbit is very elliptical. It's not like the orbits of the other planets that we've talked about so far, which are roughly circular. It's very oval shaped. And that's one of the reasons that it led to its demotion from planethood, uh, among others, uh, or at least caused people to be suspicious of whether it should be really counted as a, as a mainstream planet. Um, its orbital period is 248 Earth years. Um, which is uh, uh, obviously extremely long. It has not completed one complete orbit since the time it was discovered. Uh, we're about a third of the way through a Plutonian year since the time it was discovered. And the inclination is 17 degrees, which means that if you look at the uh, plane of the solar system, it has a pretty significant tilt um, to the plane of the solar system compared to the other planets. Another reason why uh, it was always considered an oddball planet, uh, even before the discovery of other objects that were out there. Some other facts and figures about the planet itself, it's about 2,377 kilometers uh, uh, in diameter. Its surface area is about 0 0.035 Earths, uh, so about 3% of Earth's uh, surface area. The volume is 0 0.006 Earths, and the math is, mass is 0 0, uh, 0 0.002 Earths, so it's very, very small. Um, it's obviously big enough to, to form itself into a sphere, uh, and it's uh, uh, bigger than some of the smaller moons of Saturn and Uranus, 
but it's definitely not a very large object. Surface gravity is 0 0.063 G, um, so you wouldn't weigh much. I didn't do any calculations of what a you know 100 kilo per person would would uh, weigh on Pluto, but it, they wouldn't weigh much, maybe a, a pound or two. Um, the density is 1.854. The reason that's significant is that water's density is uh, a 1.0. Um, grams per centimeter cubed. And what that means is that the object is made of something other than just water. Uh, the one of the thoughts that it was originally maybe just a, a snowball in space made of mostly water and various ices. What the density shows us is in fact, there's other things that make up Pluto than just uh, uh, light stuff like uh, water ice or methane ice or nitrogen ice, which is interesting. Um, the surface temperature is only 44 Kelvin. So just 44 degrees above absolute zero. That's an average temperature. Of course, when it comes closer into the sun, it's uh, going to be a little bit uh, uh, warmer than that. And when it's uh, further out, it may be a little bit colder, but it's obviously exceptionally cold, minus 229 degrees Celsius on um, Pluto. So cold enough for nitrogen to form into an ice. Um, so the temperatures out there are very low. A couple of things about the atmosphere. The uh, um, uh, the pressure is uh, 0 0.1.0 pascals, which is very, very thin. Um, the uh, atmosphere does change in pressure over the course of a, a, a Plutonian year. Uh, when the, the Pluto is close to the sun, uh, is probably a little bit thicker and a little bit denser. And then when it's way further out, it probably freezes entirely onto the surface of the planet, um, which actually is one of the th reasons why it was so important to send out a probe um, to get a look at the, uh, the uh, atmosphere of Pluto before it froze completely because it's on its way further out into the solar system. It has five moons, the largest is Charon, uh, which is roughly one half the size of Pluto, which was discovered in 1978. The others were discovered a little bit more recently uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. They're much, much smaller. Um, they're both the size of little asteroids or comet nuclei or the like, although they're probably formed from Pluto itself, um, unlike the asteroids or comets. Um, this is another picture of Pluto. This is with extreme uh, color enhancement. This is not what Pluto actually looks like. Um, what it does bring out is some of the different materials that make up the surface and uh, kind of highlights the dark areas and the, the, uh, um, the areas that are um, lightly colored. Uh, it becomes a, a nice uh, red, white, and blue thing too, kind of a pretty picture, um, but not necessarily uh, very accurate, but it does show the kind of light regions and the dark regions. And I thought it was kind of a fun picture. Um, so some size comparisons, here's a compare, rough comparison with Earth. Earth is uh, about 12,760 kilometers in diameter, and Pluto is only about 2,300 kilometers in diameter. So it's not only smaller than Mercury, it's also smaller than the Moon, and it's smaller than Eris, which is the uh, uh, slightly smaller than Eris. Uh, there is a little bit of debate going on about that. Eris is the other large object that was found out in the Kuiper Belt region um, uh, about, uh, it's coming up on 15 or 20 years ago now, but um, uh, it's uh, about the same size as, as Eris and possibly a little bit more massive um, than, than Eris is. Uh, composition. Uh, this is a rough estimate. Again, we had very little knowledge of what the uh, Pluto was like until New Horizons went by it. But it's thought that it has a crust of mostly water, uh, ices made up of mostly nitrogen and methane, and then probably water ice. Um, uh, beneath that is a mantle and then a, a rocky core that makes up about 60% of the planet. So it's made up of stuff other than just ices. It has a rocky core, which makes it a, a bit denser than it would be if it was just an ice ball. So the, the discovery of Pluto is quite a story in its own right. And I'll be spending about half the presentation talking about uh, just how this thing was discovered. And it takes us back to this character who is Percival Lowell. Um, we all remember him from uh, the Mars presentation as being the uh, um, promoter of the idea that there were canals on Mars being built by civilizations. Well, Lowell um, was an amateur. He was not a professional. Uh, he was certainly not uh, seen as a professional in his time, but he was an amateur with a lot of money to spend. Um, and he set, of course, his 
own up its own observatory in Flagstaff, the Lowell Observatory, which I'm sure many of you have been up to. I've not actually seen it, but uh, I would like to get up there at some point. Um, the Lowell Observatory was originally founded, of course, to build his telescopes so that he could have a look at Mars. Um, but Lowell also became uh, not quite obsessed, but very interested in the idea of Planet X. Um, so along with his, uh, his rather eccentric views of Martians, he was also convinced of these uh, um, ideas that Planet X was out there. And so he initiated this search for Planet X that would eventually lead to um, Pluto. So the hunt for Planet X was not exclusively by Lowell. There were some papers later proven to be erroneous that indicated that Pluto, um, there were perturbations to Neptune's orbit, which meant that uh, just as it happened with Uranus to discover Neptune, it looked like there were things that were tweaking with Neptune that were further out, um, that were being causing it to change its orbit slightly. Um, and uh, the, the thought, of course, was, well, if, if Uranus was being perturbed by Neptune, then maybe Neptune's being perturbed by a big planet that's further out. And that became the Planet X search. Lowell picked up on these articles and decided that his observatory in Flagstaff was going to find it. And he hired observers to conduct the searches. And at first, those searches were visual. So you can imagine the, the joys of sitting night after night in the telescope looking for something uh, so faint you can barely pick it up um, with a, a, a telescope. Um, and in total, three searches at Lowell uh, were low before Pluto was found. Pluto was found on the third search, not the first. Uh, and it continued after he had died. So even though um, there were funding issues right after he died and he, there was a, a big uh, contestant over his will, um, there, uh, the, uh, the money was there even during the, the 1920s and the 20, 1930s when the depression was going on uh, to continue a small search for um, Planet X. So the third search was done after Lowell had died. And by this point, the observatory had been taken over by VM Slifer, who was then director, who had only a staff of three, uh, including himself at the observatory, a permanent staff of three, uh, himself and two other astronomers. Um, none of whom were terribly interested in the Planet X project. Uh, they had their own research going on. Lowell had created an observatory that did um, very legitimate science, uh, aside from the Martian project, which really was not very legitimate, but that's another story we already went into. Um, but uh, Slifer uh, wanted to uh, continue the search that uh, uh, that uh, Lowell had uh, proposed. And he decided to hire a new assistant to run the search. Um, and this assistant needed to be young, an able observer, diligent, and very cheap um, because they had very little money at the time. It was the middle of the Depression. Things were not going well. Uh, as I said, there had, Lowell's uh, will had been contested after he died, and so the money was not really there. It was coming from some of Lowell's relatives. And so they needed someone who didn't cost very much, which means they couldn't hire a professional astronomer. Uh, to do the actual search, but they needed someone who knew his way around a telescope um, to be able to do this. So the person they came up with was Clyde Tumbaugh. Uh, Clyde Tumbaugh was only 22 when he was hired by Lowell. There's kind of an interesting story that goes on with that. Um, he was from Kansas, so he was not uh, uh, anyone. He came from a very obscure background. He was a farm boy, but he had built his own telescope um, and had shown an early interest in astronomy um, and sent sketches to Slifer of Jupiter uh, during a close uh, Jupiter approach, uh, I believe, in, in 1929 or 1930. Um, and uh, they uh, Slifer was impressed with them and figured, you know, this kid probably could be the person who would do the search. He doesn't cost very much. He doesn't expect very much. He's not a professional astronomer, so I'll hire him. And uh, Slifer hired him uh, to come to Flagstaff to run the search. The expensive part of the search was the equipment, and even that wasn't expensive by modern standards. This is the Pluto Discovery Telescope. Um, it's only 13 inches, um, and it's set up, as you notice, it's in a, a, a big wooden dome up on, uh, uh, it's not on, directly on Mars Hill, but it's close by. 
uh, is now a museum piece. It no longer functions. Um, but you can see how the, the search was done. It was a 13 inch telescope and it was meant to be relatively wide field for the, the day. And they would take big glass plates, photographic plates with um, uh, photographic emulsions and park it up, I believe, to the back of the thing, although I don't, I've never been seen a diagram of how the thing actually worked. Um, and uh, they would shoot a part of the sky and then take the plate off and store it and then shoot another part of the sky and then go on from there. And then uh, on alternating nights or different nights, uh, or possibly and then Tumbaugh had to sleep at some point, um, they would then take the uh, images uh, that were taken off of the telescope and put them in a blank comparator. Now, Today, we have computers to do this kind of, of, of uh, search or this kind of uh, um, analysis. In those days, they didn't have anything but your eyeballs. And this was why they needed someone who was relatively well-skilled at being an observer. Uh, it wasn't to run the telescope, but it was to be able to do this particular process. And basically what happens is you take a slide from one day that you took and you put it onto the left uh, uh, side of the, the blank comparator. And then you take the slide from the, uh, say five days later or 10 days later and put it on the right side of the uh, uh, slide. And this of course is assuming that you're looking at exactly the same part of the sky in both images um, and you blink between them. So uh, you have a single uh, uh, eyepiece in the middle and you flip between one image and another another, one image and another, one image for another. And hopefully by doing that, you can trigger the brain's response, which looks for moving objects. So um, you can imagine how tedious this is. Uh, this was not a very exciting way to do astronomy, but they needed somebody who could do it. And, and again, this is the, the, the only way they could think of to be able to make this work other than do an actual visual search. Um, this is a couple images of how the blink comparator worked. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, an anonymous person looking through a blank comparator. Notice it is a woman. Uh, one of the unfortunate aspects of early astronomy in the 20th century and in late 19th century is they often use women who were as skilled as the men to do this sort of scut work um, that the men thought was beneath them or didn't want to spend the time with. Now, in Clyde's case, they, of course, hired a man to do that because he was cheap. But it is one of the legacies of astronomy that uh, uh, there's, uh, until fairly recently, there was not a lot of uh, egalitarianism uh, within the field. On the right, you have uh, Tombaugh looking through the uh, blank comparator. Now, this is, picture was taken in the 40s. Uh, he obviously looks different than when uh, uh, he was a kid doing the actual project, but by then he was very well known within the field for having discovered Pluto. Um, and kind of, he was at this point demonstrating how to work without the plates in place. Um, but the blank comparator was uh, the best technology they had at a time. As I said before, today we could just put the digital images into a computer and it could pick up the, the objects moving at different places. The, um, that's relatively recent and there are still some uh, people are still looking at these old plates and, and finding new objects on them, but not the, the, the Pluto discovery plates, but some of the plates were made subsequent to that. But today we do this all electronically. Um, there's not a, There are people involved, but they're not necessarily doing this kind of a a slide by slide search. So, um, and uh, by some luck and a lot of hard work, uh, uh, Tombaugh pulled it off. On February 18th, uh, uh, 1930, he discovered that there was a very faint object uh, uh, that he uh, had observed uh, that had moved positions uh, at just the right distance to make it a, something in the far outer solar system. Uh, the actual images were taken on January 23rd and the 29th, 1930. Um, the reason for the difference in the dates is that he didn't necessarily analyze them right away. He would take do a few nights of taking pictures and then a few nights or days of doing the blank comparator. And uh, because of that, they, things had gotten a little piled up and he uh, had some images from the previous month that he did and there it was. Um, they did not uh, announce it for another month uh, where they telegraphed the Harvard College Observatory because they did not want to make a mistake. And so in that case, they wanted to go back and reobserve it and reobserve it to make sure that in fact they had found an object um, that was moving in just such a way. Well, you're thinking maybe, well, why didn't they just think it was an asteroid closer in? Again, it had to do with the speed of the object and a bunch of different characteristics, how faint it was and things like that told them they were looking at something that was really far out. Um, 
And these are the discovery images. As you can see, it's really hard to imagine how someone could visually pick this thing up, uh, given that the, uh, the, the photographic plates were not of the highest possible quality and um, the uh, the imaging was not excellent and we're dealing with a very faint object usually around I think 13th magnitude um, so it really took someone with good eyes and good observing skills to be able to put, pick this thing out in the first place uh, which he did and um, that was the discovery image that led to Pluto um, the public announcement was received with a great deal of excitement. Uh, this is from the Flagstaff newspaper of March 21st, the day after the telegram went out. Law Observatory finds a new planet, uh, planet uh, scientific achievement of the century. And for a few years, it did look like a really exciting thing. I mean, discovering a new planet is you know, something that happens maybe once a century um, and that uh, um, got a lot of news and attention. Now, some of the information that was out there, um, we now know today was incorrect. But what we actually, uh, the problem was that at the time, some of this information was considered to be accurate. So the, at first they thought Pluto was quite a bit larger than it was. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because they hadn't quite figured out the full orbit yet. And also they uh, hadn't um, uh, figured out how bright this thing really was in space. Remember, if, you, if you're looking at a small object that's very, very bright, it's gonna look as bright as a, uh, a big object that's very dim that's further away. Um, and so they weren't exactly sure how bright the object was, and it took them years to be able to figure that out. Uh, so for the first few years, they thought it were, they were looking at an object that was at least bigger than Earth. Um, and so there was some excitement that Planet X had finally been found. Um, Pluto was first uh, considered to be Planet X, and, and Lowell, of course, uh, Lowell Observatory wanted to take credit for that. But over the next couple decades, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, continued debate about whether or not Pluto was in fact Planet X. So the biggest problems were that the uh, issues with size. The original estimates indicated that it was about the size of Earth. But the size of Pluto took years and even decades to solve. And part of the problem was with Alba Al Albedo, which is the reflectivity of the object. Scientists weren't exactly sure what the heck this thing was made of. If it was made of solid rock, like granite or, or a, a worse yet slate or something like that, it was a big object because it would uh, uh, not reflect a lot of light and therefore had to be uh, fairly big to be as bright as it was. Now, if it was made of uh, uh, pure glass reflecting uh, all the light back at uh, at us, then it was very small um, because it was uh, it would be a small object that would reflect a lot of light and, and wouldn't need to be very big to be as dim as it was. Um, it be eventually became clear that Pluto is far too small to ever have anything to do with the orbit of Neptune. In fact, it worked in the reverse. The orbit of Neptune and the position of Neptune had a great deal with the position of Pluto, but it did not, Pluto did not perturb the orbit of Neptune. And then eventually, of course, they figured out that the, the original predictions of planet X were proven false. Neptune was not being perturbed by any unseen object. And you may think, well, what about the whole thing right now going on about this whole uh, planet nine thing, which I'm only going to touch on briefly. Um, uh, that has nothing to do with Neptune. Uh, that has to do with objects out in the Kuiper Belt and some orbits that uh, have been discovered with them. So Neptune was not being perturbed by an unseen object and Pluto was too small to be it anyway. So uh, coming up in the 70s, which was another 40 years later, um, there not much was known about Pluto. It was very distant. It was very cold and very small and very dark and, and uh, very hard to study. Um, and there had always been questions about whether or not it had moons or anything like that. Well, um, in the 1976, you know, 78, uh, that moon was discovered. It was discovered by uh, someone named uh, James Christie up working up in again in uh, northern Arizona this time at the um, uh, the Naval Observatory up there and he noticed that some of the images he took of Pluto had a bump on it and uh, he noticed that the bump um, uh, were alternating every 6.39 Earth days, which is the same as Pluto's rotation, which had already been established by looking at light curves. Um, a moon had been detected, and it was named Sharon 
after the uh, Greek ferryman who crossed the River Styx. Now, everyone who knows anything about Greek mythology and is, is probably cringing at the way I'm pronouncing it, which is Sharon. Why Sharon and not Charon? Uh, because the actual Greek way of saying Sharon was Charon. Uh, well, the reason was that Christie wanted it when he named it to sound something like the name of his wife, Charlene. So we always use Sharon instead of Charon or Karen um, as the name for, um, uh, for the moon, even though technically it's incorrect in Greek, it should be closer to a ka sound than a sha. Um, so just to put that out, that the correct way to say it is Sharon, not Charon. Charon is about half the size of Pluto. Uh, and this makes the system a near double planet, which means the two planets which are about the same size orbiting each other. It's the largest ratio of the moon to planet size in the solar system, and they're mutually synchronously locked, which means that not only does uh, Karen or Sharon keep the same side pointed towards Pluto, but Pluto also keeps the same size pointed towards Sharon. So they go around sort of like a dumbbell in space, except there's not only just gravity linking them together. They are separated in space, but they're, they're facing each other in the same way. And why? Because the mutual tidal effects were so strong over the period of their evolution that, um, that they became mutually tidally locked. Uh, the most likely origin of Sharon is probably a massive collision early in the solar system, which probably is the source of the other moons that we'll talk about in a second as well. So some other discoveries, methane ice was discovered by a uh, Cruikshank culture in Morrison in 1976. Um, it was the first time, according to my source, that uh, uh, non-water ice was detected in the outer solar systems. That was somewhat exciting um, and allowed better estimates of Pluto's size and composition because we had an idea of what it was made of. Um, Again, that discovery is also made here in Arizona at Kitt Peak. Um, so a lot of Arizona history going into Pluto. Um, so early visit opportunities. So na naturally everybody's got this planet out there. It's the ninth one. And the question is, why don't we just go there and with a probe? Um, so Voyager, uh, when it was originally conceived very, very early on in the mission, there was the thought of a fly by a Pluto um, as part of either Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 mission. Not easy to do, wasn't uh, um, something that they could do easily, but it was a possibility. Pluto was not a very high priority for Voyager. Voyager was really meant to go to Jupiter and Saturn, and if they got very lucky, Uranus and Neptune. And Pluto was quickly kind of decided, well, this is probably not our big thing that we're going to be doing. They wanted to do, instead do other targets. And there was also the difficulty of getting out that far and also keeping a probe alive that long. Now, if they had known that the, the Voyager probes were going to last 45 years or 50 years uh, in 1975 when they planned this out, they might have given it more serious consideration. But at the time, it was just considered too, too far-fetched. By 1989, Voyager 2 had completed the exploration of Neptune. And uh, there's, of course, one more planet left in the solar system. And various missions were proposed, but none were approved. So then New Horizons gets started. It was not, as I said, the first Pluto mission that was proposed even at the time. There have been several others which have been uh, uh, studied by NASA and been denied. Um, but by the end of the 20th century, it was clear that the last planet in the solar system would be the last to be visited by spacecraft. The USA had done all of the recon of the outer solar system, but it, you know, the, it was only natural to think, why not go still further out? In December of 2000, uh, APL at Johns Hopkins University forms a team with Dr. Alan Stern as its head, and that begins the, the New Horizons project. And in November 2001, about a year later, New Horizons was officially started as a new, uh, uh, a new Frontiers program. Uh, which is New Frontiers is a medium size and medium cost mission uh, that uh, is uh, proposed by NASA. So it's between Discovery, which is small, and the flagship missions, which are really big and really expensive. Um, the problem was that in 2000, there had been a, a change in NASA administration, and uh, the new administrator, Sean O'Keefe, did not support uh, the Pluto mission. He was actually more in favor of Europa mission. There was a lot of, uh, if you remember uh, in the early Bush administration, a lot of interest in nuclear engines in space and things along those lines that were going to be tested at Jupiter. And so the uh, New Horizons, even though it wasn't that big of an expense, was nixed from the NASA budget. But after external pressure, especially from uh, 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 Maryland's uh, uh, senator in the, in the Senate, um, 
NASA agrees to reactivate the, uh, the project if it wins support of the decadal survey. Now the decadal survey is a survey that's done every 10 years about, there's doing one I believe now or soon will be, um, uh, that um, uh, looks at the priorities for both planetary science and astronomy for the next 10 years. And it doesn't set the budget for NASA, but NASA tends to follow it uh, when it's deciding which missions to launch and which programs to follow, as does the NSA, the National Science Foundation, um, and some other agencies that are out there that, that make decisions on funding. In June 2002, the Decadal Survey named the Pluto mission the prior uh, its top priority, and NASA reinstates the mission, but with caveats. They wanted some new technology tested on it and, and things like that that would uh, promote other priorities. Um, there was also a lot of bureaucratic infighting between APL and JPL, the Applied Physics Laboratory versus the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. NASA is made up of a bunch of uh, different agencies which tend to detest each other. Um, uh, and um, the reality is that uh, they get in a lot of bureaucratic fights within the agency over who has funding for what and who is running what project and the like. Um, but NASA did include, or APL did include JPL on some of the, 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 the uh, instrumentation and different equipment that were on the probe as well. So it wasn't entirely left out of the picture, but uh, that was one of the reasons why it, it took so long to get the thing instated. Um, and then between 2002 and 2006, the spacecraft was designed and built. There were a number of constraints on the mission um, that had to do with timing. So they needed it to be powered at far, the far reaches of the solar system, which means the solar panels were obviously utterly useless at Pluto's distance. Um, so it needed to have a nuclear react, not, it's not a nuclear reactor, it's a, it's a plutonium battery um, that uh, generates a, a fairly small amount of electric power, but at extremely cold temperatures and without any need, need for sunlight. Um, it needed to get to Pluto within the lifetime of the engineers and scientists who created it. This was actually a real concern when they put this mission together. If it was going to go on for 50 years, half the scientists that would uh, start it would be dead. Uh, it needed to be lightweight um, because it ne needed to, uh, to fly on a conventional booster, which limited how big this thing was. By conventional booster, meant it couldn't wait for a big NASA super rocket. It had to be something that would fly on either an Atlas or Delta. Um, it needed to be very, very fast in order to meet those time constraints and need to make a Jupiter flyby to be able to get, gain more speed. As a result, an, an orbital mission to Pluto was absolutely impossible because it would require vast amounts of fuel to be able to slow it down. Uh, Pluto does not have much of a gravitational pull. It, would, it has to slow down, an object has to slow down quite a bit to be able to uh, get into Pluto orbit. And uh, it would have been possible to build with the weight and time constraints. So they needed a flyby mission rather than an orbital mission. This is one of the reasons why orbital missions to Pluto are so hard is that uh, in order to get up to speed to get out there, you'd have to carry a huge amount of fuel to slow down. And that's still a problem that they would have with an orbital mission. So New Horizons was conceived. This is a back end image of the probe. Um, it is about the size of a grand piano uh, without the appendages on the side. On the left hand side, you can see this plutonium battery. I think it's called an RTG, but it's uh, uh, basically just a, a plutonium thing that puts off heat that they convert into electricity that then powers the probe. And of course, some of the instrumentation. This was a picture or an, uh, an art image that was created long before um, the actual mission when they did not have any clue what Pluto looked like. Um, so that's why the, the, uh, the surface of Pluto doesn't look anything like the later pictures. This is a, a diagram of the, uh, the probe itself. Rex is a radio, uh, uh, is of course, there's the very large uh, radio antenna to be able to communicate that far out. Uh, but Rex was also a radio science uh, instrument designed to do some experiments on the Pluto's atmosphere. Uh, Ralph and Alice uh, were both spectrometers. Lori was the main camera. Uh, Swap, I believe, was looking at solar um, uh, wind out that distance, and Pepsi was a particle detector. Uh, they still are uh, out there. The, the, the probe is still functioning, um, but those were the different instruments that were taken along with it, uh, the probe. Um, now, this was actually uh, looking at the entire mission. Um, 
But as said, the uh, uh, the Jupiter system, uh, they had to do a flyby of Jupiter in 2007, and then a uh, roughly a 10 year cruise. Uh, uh, well, that would be, be about an eight year cruise out to Pluto um, in order to get out there within you know 15 or 20 year goal was uh, what they were looking for for the mission. This was the uh, launch of the mission in, uh, I believe it was 2005 um, and, uh, or 2006. And uh, as you can see, this is an Atlas booster. It's the largest version of the booster they have. Even though the probe is fairly small, they needed the biggest booster they could come up with in order to fly this thing out there. It was small so that it would be lightweight, um, so they could accelerate it a lot more than if it was a big heavy probe. Um, and so they gave it uh, the biggest booster they could without using a big Delta heavy, which would have cost too much. Um, so they, uh, they, found, they found the biggest booster they could and left it. When it left Earth, it was the fastest object that had left Earth at that time. In the meantime, Pluto uh, was being studied by Hubble. There have been studies that have done by, uh, by Hubble going back since Hubble's uh, images was corrected. And this is uh, um, basically what they saw when they looked at uh, Pluto through Hubble was basically a smudged image. Now, this was really cool when they took the image, they could see anything at all, uh, given the distance and the low light out there, but there wasn't really much that they had picked up yet. They knew there were dark areas and that there were light areas. And beyond that, they really uh, had very little information information about it. One cool thing that was discovered um, it, by Hubble was the, the, the four additional moons. Uh, Charon had been, or Sharon had been known since uh, uh, the 1970s, but in uh, uh, 2012, as the probe was actually on its way out, they discovered uh, four more moons uh, that were named Hydra, Nix, um, I don't remember the other two off the top of my head, but they were, we'll, I'll have another diagram of them later on. They're very small compared to Sharon. Uh, they're only the size of asteroids. So in the meantime, uh, bad news hits the mission while it's on its way out. Pluto gets demoted. Uh, in August, 2006, I, the IAU redefines a planet um, it says that a planet has to orbit the sun, which Pluto does, has to have a spherical shape, which Pluto has. And they added this, this third constraint, which has to, says that it has to clear its orbit. Um, well, Pluto had not cleared its orbit. It's smack in the middle of the Kuiper belt with a bunch of other objects in that region of space, not near it. Um, and uh, no one was really happy with this definition, if you, except with a few dynamicists um, who put it together. Um, but the effect was it demoted Pluto to a dwarf planet status. Um, there was a lot of public outcry and a lot of people were upset about it. Um, still are a lot of outcry. I'm sure people in this group have a lot of different opinions about whether Pluto is a planet or not. Um, but the changes have stuck. It's been uh, true that way now for 15 years. Um, Pluto has been demoted to a non-planet. Uh, I'm not going to go into that debate, just to note that uh, one of the things that happened during the mission was that Pluto got demoted. So when it was launched, it was going out to the ninth planet. When New Horizons got to the uh, Pluto, it, was, it arrived at a dwarf planet. Um, of course, it was the same object either way, um, but uh, it got a, a public demotion at least because of the different constraints that were out there. So the Pluto encounter happened on July 14th, 2015. Uh, so not that long ago, only six years ago. This is a close up of uh, the part of the uh, uh, planet that was, or, the, or dwarf planet, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, that was later uh, designated. Tumbal Regio after um, its a discoverer. Uh, and um, we're going to have some closer up images of the, 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 uh, the planet in just a second. As you can see, it's a very varied surface. So there are parts that are smooth as glass or other parts that are heavily cratered and, and all sorts of different features in between. So one of the things about Pluto is regardless of what you call it, it's a really interesting object. There's a lot going on out there. In fact, a lot more than a lot of people anticipated when they first uh, uh, launched the probe. I'm going to go into some details with that. This is uh, some of the, the official names. Um, Tumbal Regio is named after Clyde. Um, that was considered a, a, a tribute to him. Um, several of the features were named after old uh, probe missions and probe groups. So Lowell was named after the, the observatory at which the discovery was made. Vanilla 
era where the Russian Jiro course was Voyager, which we already talked about, Pioneer. Hayabasa was a Japanese mission. Um, and then uh, uh, Viking was the mission to uh, Mars. Uh, some of the darker regions were named after underworld characters of various kinds of fiction. Uh, Cthulhu, of course, is, uh, um, I believe, from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and the like. Um, so they came up with some really interesting names with that. This is a picture of the whole northern part of the planet. Notice that the southern part is completely uh, dark. The reason for that is that it was completely in darkness um, at the time that the images were taken. So we have no knowledge of what that part of Pluto looks like. Uh, the area in the middle is the area that was best photographed because that's the, the um, position that the, the planet was in when the probe was approaching it. Um, as they go further out, the images get a much more hazy and sketchy. Um, some of them are even taken in, in reflected moonlight off of Karen, Sharon. Um, I keep making that mistake too. Um, but um, as you can see, we got a good look at the image of the, the general idea of the planet. Um, there are uh, different parts, again, different uh, named objects. Not Certainly not all the features on Pluto have been named, just the really big ones and, and bright ones. Uh, uh, Sputnik uh, is the left side of Tumbal Regio. Uh, is the smooth plane. It's basically a, kind of a, a, a giant glacier ice cap made of, net, uh, of uh, uh, nitrogen ice. Um, some of the names were done for like uh, Tenzing Norgay, the first person on the top of Everest and various explorers who were um, uh, uh, made great achievements in the 20th century and the like of the 19th century to get uh, uh, to, to um, you know, reach, uh, reach different heights in different places. Um, this is uh, some of the close-up images that we uh, received back. This is the edge of Sputnik Planum in, in Tumbal Regio where it meets some of the highlands that are around it. Uh, Sputnik Planum ended up being one of the most interesting features because it's almost completely devoid of craters. You'll see those little teeny tiny pock marks, though. They're about a kilometer wide and they're actually made by outgassing. When the uh, Pluto comes close to the sun, it warms up and some of the nitrogen ice melts and it kind of puffs up above the crust and uh, creates these little craterlets um, that are seen throughout there. Uh, and then, of course, on the right, you can see that the, the areas uh, uh, in the highlands are much more rough um, with a lot more uh, terrain there than you have on the, uh, the ice cap itself. This is another image of um, that same icy region. The reason for the lobes, they believe, is because of very slow moving conve convection within the nitrogen ice. I mean, remember, we're talking nitrogen ice here. We're not talking water ice. Uh, the, the mountains may be made of a fair amount of water ice, but with nitrogen ice, we're talking really 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 cold so liquid nitrogen is something that'll um, you know freeze your arm off if you you dip your arm in it uh, this is solid nitrogen so um, this is really really cold stuff but in that kind of environment is uh, warm enough for some very slow moving convection to happen on, within the ice to uh, uh, cause those kind of lobe features this is a close-up of some of those other features we looked at. Um, you can see Sputnik playing them up on the top and those polygons. And then the Cthulhu region, which is darker and much more heavily cratered. And some of the high mountains uh, under Hillary Montes and uh, uh, various ice sheets. So it's all ice by Earth standards, but it's, it's so cold that uh, water ice there would function just like granite. It would be incredibly hard and dense. Um, and so they, the, you have different features based on which type of ice are looking at. Um, this is again another interface between some of those highlands and some of those uh, 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 those that ice plain. Um, as you can see on the, on the edges, the ice plain kind of stretches out into some of those valleys to act like glaciers. Uh, it would be glaciers made of nitrogen ice rather than water ice. And, and it, there's also rippling that you can see on the surface of the ice. Uh, in that case, it may very well be dunes uh, caused by winds in Pluto's very, very thin atmosphere. So we've seen dunes on a lot of objects in the solar system, Mars, Titan, and now we've seen them on Pluto. Uh, this is one of the more interesting features and it's hotly debated. Uh, it's called Wright Mons. It's in the, at the bottom uh, left of the image is that big pockmark you see. 
Uh, and that is thought to possibly be a shield volcano. Um, it was not active at the time that the, uh, the images were taken. Uh, so we're not sure if it's a volcano or even if it's still an active volcano. Um, but it could very well be a, a shield with a crater in the middle and then sort of the smooth size that we see. If it's erupting anything, it's erupting stuff that's very, very volatile on Earth. So possibly water, but also possibly liquid nitrogen or methane um, that uh, uh, would be coming out of it. So it's a cryovolcano. It's not shooting up lava as we think of it, but it's uh, uh, stuff that would be a very, very cold, which indicates that at one point there's a possibility it was the, the planet was geologically active. This is another angle image of the same image taken from a different direction. I think it's the same image, just looking at it uh, uh, reverse, slightly higher. Um, uh, this may be the other one. There were two of these objects that were or features that were found on Pluto. Uh, this may be the second one. Um, that was certainly an interesting object. There'll be a lot of debate for years about whether or not we're looking at volcanism or not, and a good reason to go back. This is some of those highlands. As you can see, it, they were much more rough than, uh, um, uh, than the other areas. Uh, again, in these particular parts, not a whole lot of craters, uh, which suggests a fairly young surface. So something is keeping the, the planet, at least uh, by geological times, relatively active. Um, that could be weathering. It could be um, some kind of tectonic force. It could be the movement of ice, all sorts of things. But it definitely is a much more active surface than they expected. This is an interesting uh, object. This is a nitrogen lake with uh, um, quotation marks around it. It's actually completely frozen, not liquid nitrogen, but it appears that um, at some point it was liquid. Uh, liquid nitrogen came up and froze on the surface um, and uh, is almost completely smooth. So um, at some point there was liquid nitrogen on the surface, uh, uh, acting like it, uh, a fluid like water um, that was liquid and then froze. This was an image taken in the backlit. They purposely did this. This was not an accidental image because they wanted to get a look at the atmosphere. And they knew if they backlit Pluto um, and they waited until the, the probe was already behind the planet, they could look back and see if there was any kind of a haze or atmosphere around it. In fact, they found both. Um, the atmosphere, as I indicated at the beginning of the presentation, very, very, very thin, but it is there. It's mostly nitrogen with a few other things mixed in, just like Earth's atmosphere, but not in the same, same ratios. There's some carbon monoxide and other things in there too it would not be breathable even if it was thick. Um, but it, it is it definitely has an atmosphere that is not yet frozen off the surface, which is what they were looking for um, when they found it. So some exciting thing and there's even indications of hazes in that atmosphere, uh, which indicates more complex than just gas sort of surrounding the planet. So this, uh, um, this was a uh, presentation is also dedicated to Sharon, um, which turned out to be a very interesting object in its own right as well. This is the, uh, the, uh, the global image. They didn't get really close to Sharon. The, the probe was meant to get really close to Pluto. You couldn't get close to Sharon based on its trajectory, but uh, they did get some really cool images. This is um, what uh, uh, they uh, came up with. Um, on this. As you can see, it is quite a, a lot of topography on it. Uh, there's ridges, there's there's canyons, there's uh, uh, rills, and there's also this big red thing up at the top at the Northern Pole, um, which we'll talk about in just a second because I have a better picture of that. This is the name of some of the um, images on, I believe, uh, this does look like, this is, uh, um, this is uh, 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 Sharon. Um, I don't know if these are the original, they, when they uh, originally took pictures, they created a bunch of temporary names and they created a bunch of permanent names that were approved by the IAU. And I don't know if this is it, but for, for Karen, they, they took names from fantasy novels and science fictions. So there's a lot of fun names on, on Sharon. Um, so uh, some of the, the, uh, the picture, uh, the, uh, the uh, features were named after authors and, and, and the like, but they're also, uh, so like uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Kubrick were both responsible for 2001 A Space Odyssey see. Um, but there's some other cool names as well. Vulcan Planum uh, was after Star Trek along with uh, Kirk Crater, uh, Clark Mons, um, and Spock Crater. 
Um, there's a Skywalker crater, a Leia Organa crater, and a Ripley crater after Alien. Um, again, I think these are the permanent names that were chosen. Um, they, they were very creative with the names that they came up with um, for, um, for Sharon, and it would be fun to visit some of these places. Serenity Chasma after uh, um, uh, um, uh, Firefly and the like. So there's a lot of cool names on this particular object. This is um, the Northern Pole. It's an extrapolated image. There's this big red mark on the Northern Pole. And uh, it's really interesting because of what it's made of. Remember when we talked about Titan, we talked about those materials called tholins, which are precursor molecules to organic molecules. They think that this, uh, this is not exactly an ice cap, but this big smudge on the northern end of uh, Sharon is probably more tholins, um, just sort of on the surface there. Um, some other things they found were these uh, obviously very large uh, um, uh, areas that look like uh, uh, canyons or valleys. And they found these little ripples and, and like as well. One of the things you'll notice is there are big craters, but there aren't a lot of small craters. And they found this out in the end when they took the images of that uh, Kuiper Belt object uh, a few years ago with uh, New Horizons as well. And this is leading to some thought um, that there may not be a lot of small objects in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, it's leading to the thought that there are some big objects out there, but the, unlike the, the uh, asteroid belt, it may not have a lot of small little mirror size uh, things out there. So that's, a, that's a, a thought. It's not a concluded thing yet, um, but it is something that's at least interesting and we're seeing as a pattern out in the outer solar system. Again, more of these ripples and, and the thought behind these ripples, I don't um, sure, I'm not sure if they've completely concluded what these are, but one thought is that as uh, Sharon is made of mostly ice on the interior, water ice on the interior, and at one point, uh, some of that ice may have been liquid or at least a slush. And as it froze over, it expanded as ice does, and that caused the outer surface to sort of crack as the moon got just a little bit bigger. And so we may be looking at some of the evidence of this moon having frozen up at some point point early in its history. Again, you have these Grand Canyons on, on uh, uh, Sharon, which are very interesting. It's, uh, it's got a lot of geological activity, at least in its early history. Um, probably not so much recently, but uh, things that happened billions of years ago. Uh, this is one of those canyons or at least areas where um, the, uh, the um, uh, basically, I believe it's called a, um, uh, what is it, Graben, I think is what it's called, is where the, the, uh, the uh, be two faults form and the land between it falls. Uh, I'm probably getting my geology mixed up completely. Um, but again, some of these craters there are some big craters that are fairly recent on uh, uh, Sharon with some fun names, Organic Crater, Skywalker Crater. Uh, these are a bunch of the other features, including the interesting one was I thought was on the bottom uh, left, uh, which kind of shows that some of these craters have been filled in. Um, so we see that happening on the moon um, it, when uh, lava overflanked, overtook the flanks of the crater and filled it in. We don't really know what's going on on uh, Sharon, but uh, interesting geology, certainly much more interesting geology than that. And one of the biggest canyons in the solar system. I don't think it has a name yet, um, but they discovered this over on the limb uh, is this big, dark, deep canyon, probably not as big as the one or deep as the one on Miranda, moon of Uranus, but it is an interesting uh, feature that they they found uh, this huge canyon on there. So, uh, and this is sort of a swath of slightly higher resolution of, uh, of uh, the um, uh, different types of, types of terrain on uh, uh, Sharon as the uh, probe went by. Uh, this is, a, I believe, a um, stitched together image, a mosaic of several different images that were taken during the flyby when um, uh, the uh, New Horizons turned his cameras to go look at Sharon. So as you can see, some, some heavy cratering, but not a lot of small cratering and a lot of different kind of fractures and canyons and rills and rifts and things like that um, that really don't yet have an explanation. So Sharon is a much more, as I said, more, much more interesting than they originally anticipated. They thought it would be completely cratered over and there'd be not much to see, um, but there was certainly plenty to see there. So this is a picture of the smaller moons. Uh, the bottom thing, the dark thing or bright thing on the bottom is Sharon, would give you a roughly a, idea of what the scale is. Um, the other ones were Styx, Nix, Caribos, and my picture's in the way. Um, oops, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, oops, I'm not doing well here. What did I do? 
I'm not quite sure what happened, but that was the end of the the, the uh, uh, presentation anyway. So um, I know I just gave a lot of information. Any questions on any of that that I can answer? I, I, I did a fair amount of research on this, but there's a lot about this I still don't know. So I may not be able to answer every question, but if you have them, this would be a great time. Um, so Stefan, I, I put a little message in the chat. There is another theory that explains why there are so few small craters on these objects. Um, and that is that these objects have a lot of ice in the crust mm -hmm. on the surface. And uh, the ice is not totally solid. It, it, it slowly, uh, if you deform it like with a small crater, it's over a... time it sort of flows and fills in. Mm -hmm. Big craters will stay there a long time, but the small craters will eventually go away. That's interesting because um, that that uh, that seems perfectly reasonable for Pluto and Charon. I wonder if that would make sense out at uh, uh, the the Kuiper Belt objects that they well, um, pass the current by. Current theory is that you're going to see that effect on any object that's got a lot of ices in it, which um, probably would include objects out in the Kuiper Belt. Okay. I thought well, Ultima Thule was I, a giant hunk of rock. It didn't have any ices in it because it was like a semi-protoplanet asteroid. Say again? I was, I remember that Ultima Thule was a pr hunk of rock. It wasn't really an ice body. Oh, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one. That's the other, that's the other object that they visited with deep horizons, with new horizons. Well, if it's a rock, then it's different. But it, it's, Definitely something they've seen on, um, they, they, they understand that effect with ice really well. Ice flows like in a glacier. Mm -hmm. It flows over time slowly, but it would erase small craters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a completely blank white screen. I am too. I'm not exactly sure how that happened. I'm going to turn the stop share off and figure yeah. out what happened to my computer. <laughs> I think I think my, I think I think my computer crashed behind all of this. Uh -huh. um, so uh, there will be no more pictures of Pluto tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Informative as always, Stephen. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, that's going to wrap up the presentations for the evening. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. Um, just have it, if people want to hang around and chat about random things, we can do that for about 10, 15 minutes. No problem.